Hey, hello and welcome to this, this week's Stan the Energy Man. Stan Osterman here, coming to you from beautiful downtown Honolulu, Hawaii. And the weather is beautiful, it has been all week. You should be here vacationing and spending all your money in our beautiful state, touristing and checking out the surf and all the good things. California has some good things too, including my guest today. But before we get to my guest, I wanted to show a short video that we didn't get to show last show that we were trying to squeak in, but we were trying to do a technical moonshot last week from the Big Island, and it was tough to squeeze this video in. But I want to show it because a lot of people think that hydrogen is invisible when it burns. And that's, that's true out in daylight, but it's not true at night or indoors. So we have a, a really neat video. And this is a video of hydrogen burning in especially made This is, uh, was manufactured by Blue Planet Research. And um, the flame is actually done in that little center section. The uh, kind of gold silver colored ring around it is the normal burner that he uses in there to burn hydrogen. But we call this the Starfire burner. And it's, it's meant to be used in, uh, in some high tech applications with uh, igniting uh, other things or cooking, but it's just really a beautiful flame. And, Outdoors, you would never see it. If you took that, we've actually taken that, that burner outside and you can't see the flame. You can see the heat waves on the concrete and you can definitely feel the heat when it, when it comes off of there. But again, hydrogen doesn't have any carbon in it. So if you're next to the flame, it doesn't radiate heat sideways or down, but over the flame or wherever the flame is jetting, the direction it's jetting, it's hot. It's 500 plus degrees. So I just want to start off with that and say it's, it was really fun being with Paul and uh, on the Big Island and Andy Belt from Giener. I got it right this time, Andy, Giener. Guys make electrolyzers over there. And this week we've got uh, my old battle buddy uh, in the hydrogen wars, um, Keith Malone from California Fuel Cell Partnerships. So welcome, Keith. Thank you, Stan. Got your surfboard Great ready. Great to be here. Are you, are you waxing up your surfboard there in California yet? You know, I'm not really a surfer myself. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for surfers, but, um, you know, we've got some pretty decent surf weather. It's a little cold here, but it's still warmer than a lot of other areas <laughs> across the U.S. So I would say if you can't make it to um, Hawaii this year, perhaps you can visit us in Southern California. Okay. Well, Keith, why don't you start off by telling the viewers a little bit about um, what you do in California for the California Fuel Cell Partnership and then we'll get into some of the stuff that uh, that you do, specifically letting the rest of us know all that's going on in the world of hydrogen and uh, doing a great service for everybody else that doesn't live in California. Okay, so so I've been with the I am I am kind of what you might call the public affairs guy at the California Hydrogen uh, the California Fuel Cell Partnership, and I've been with the partnership for now for about seven and a half years. I've been driving a fuel cell car for about six and a half of those years, seven of those years. Um, I've driven almost every kind of fuel cell car there is from uh, the Hyundai Tucson fuel cell, the Honda Clarity fuel cell, the Toyota Mirai, and now I currently drive the Hyundai Nexo fuel cell. How do you like that and Nexo? With the part, they're all great cars. I love them all. They're all great for various reasons. Um, but yeah, I've been driving the Hyundai Nexo now for a little over a month. I've driven it down to San Diego and up to San La Barbara and San Luis Obispo. And it's um, like all the cars. It's damn fun to drive. Neat. I've haven't and I driven, hold my own. In I haven't driven the Nexo yet. I've driven all the other ones you mentioned, including the Mercedes. They had one at uh, one of the shows or conferences you had there in California. And I got to drive the Mercedes as well. But both of the Hyundai yep. vehicles, I, I was really impressed with both of both of those. And uh, of course, we have the Mirai here in Hawaii. But uh, yeah, people, if you get a chance to drive a fuel cell vehicle, you got to go do it. it. It's a mind blowing experience. It's really cool. They're they're quick off the off the start. They're uh, great handling. They have low center of gravity. They're they're just good vehicles. And if you're a real aficionado of uh, drive trains and vehicles, I think you'd be impressed. Like, like I tell people, they are damn fun cars to drive, and I hold my own in, in crazy L.A. traffic. <laughs> Everybody's going 70. I'm going 70 as well. 
If there's an idiot in front of me, like any good Angelino, I will yell at him or her first, hit the gas, and go right around him. There Not a go. problem. <laughs> so Keith, what's what's so. been going on in California lately? How many stations are you up to now? So right now we're at about we're at 40 plus. We got another 20 stations in development. So we should see a lot of stations come online this year here in California. And just a couple of weeks ago, the California Energy Commission released a grant funding opportunity for uh, light duty stations. That's what we call them, stations that are primarily focused on the passenger vehicle market. And in California, we have kind of two critical milestones. The first one is 100 stations. And so uh, this funding uh, opportunity should get us well beyond uh, 100 stations. And the next goal we have is 200 stations. And so you're going to see stakeholders here in California uh, talking with government agencies as well as the California legislature to get us to that 200 station mark. Yeah, I have a question so, for you. We haven't, uh, here in Hawaii, we haven't started selling any hydrogen yet from our Servco station that I know of. I haven't talked to them this month, but last month they still were, were working it. And the problem was, and I know you guys have worked your way through it already, is how do you give a kilogram worth of hydrogen and you guarantee it with a little sticker from the Department of Agriculture on the pump that says it gives a real a one, one kilogram when it says it's giving a kilogram. I know that because measuring, people don't think about this, but with hydrogen, you're measuring a gas and not a liquid. Liquid's not very compressible, but gases are. So if the gas is hotter or colder, you get a different actual volume of fuel. So have you in California got that through the state and, and got it all regulated yet? Or are you still, the car's just being leased out and the, it's still part of the purchase price of the lease of the vehicle? So uh, the fuel cell partnership, we're a public-private partnership, government agencies at all levels and private industry, and we work together. And one of our members is the Weights and Measures Division of the California Department of Food and Agriculture. And so our members have worked closely with them over the years to ensure that, um, that we have a system for verifying stations and to making sure that they operate correctly. And so we have stations, all of these stations that we describe as retail stations, they have to meet certain, um, certain standards. And that includes the approval of the weights and measures folks, both either uh, from the state of California or any local jurisdictions. Okay. So I, I assume, because Toyota is very involved with that Servco station, that they have linked Hawaii officials up with California state officials to ensure that they're able to, to achieve that. Okay. Wish I could go into more technical side of things, but I'm just the pretty public affairs face. Yeah. Um, no. Technical side. I can at least describe to you the relationships and kind of where we are. How about that? Okay. No, it's just good to hear how many stations you've got up. I think the last time I checked in with you, it was in the 30s, and now we're over 40. And uh, yeah, you and I, on your way to on your way to your first hundred. And and there is a a real recognition in the last year or two that it's time to go to scale. Um, this certainly this California Energy Commission grant funding opportunity that's out on the streets. Um, that's certainly going to be helpful but we're beginning to see others kind of what I like to say, get into the game. Like for example, recently we saw that Chevron joined the hydrogen council and in the press release where they announced they're joining the, the council, they also said that they are gonna be opening up some test stations some pilot stations. Uh, really not so much to prove the technology, we're well beyond that, but really kind of, I think for them, figuring out what kind of business model they want to, um, employ as they move forward. And we also have, uh, we just added to our low carbon fuel standard. It's a program that really works to um, incentivize the production of low carbon fuels. Uh, early last year, the California Air Resources Board added a new regulation to it, added a new section that incentivizes the creation of zero emission infrastructure. So basically it incentivizes uh, the creation of um, uh, the development of uh, charging stations as well as hydrogen stations. And so that's another kind of uh, multiplier 
to, to describe it that way. Another market mechanism to really kind of push the development of hydrogen infrastructure as well as electric battery electric charging infrastructure. Yeah, the, the Department of Energy recently came out with some funding opportunities as well. And I know you, you probably haven't, I even had to, haven't had time to really dig into it. You probably haven't either, but um, that's kind of late breaking news right after the holidays. The Department of Energy hydrogen folks, um, they're really, they've been pushing the hydrogen at scale for like two years now. And um, their partner on the civilian side is the hydrogen fuel cell or hydrogen council, which is, um, and they started off with maybe 18, 16 or 18 members in January of 2017. And last time I checked, they were approaching 60 members. Um, and oh. since they've been involved, oh, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. it's way more. 81 they've, members now. Wow, they have just taken off. And, and I think that the the spike that you see in the, and, the, and the rush on the hydrogen is has a lot to do with the members that are joining there's, there's like a, a big um, magnet there of people who want to move into hydrogen that have the horsepower, the technology, and everything else to make it happen. And they're all sitting around the table talking. And it's like, I, I think they're even competing to see who gets there first and really make things happen. So I saw that um, article that, by the way, everybody out there, um, he sends out a really good newsletter uh, on the internet. So maybe you can give them the, the website or whatever to... Uh, to check on that, but uh, it's great info and uh, articles to track down if you're interested in hydrogen topics. Um, Keith screens the world for uh, the most pertinent and concise information on anything hydrogen and puts it in his uh, in his blog there. And uh, so, what's your what's your website again? So our website is cafcp.org. So California Fuel Cell Partnership, CAFCP. Correct. And on the website, there are a couple things you can do if you want to stay in touch. So one of them is at the very bottom of the website, like most websites, you can sign up for our newsletter. We periodically push out information. It's not a weekly um, or bi-weekly. It's we push out, we try not to overwhelm our subscribers. We only push out information uh, when we think it's important. For example, we pushed out information in early January about the California Energy Commission funding. Um, we also, uh, just earlier this week, talking about the Hydrogen Council, we pushed out an announcement from the Hydrogen Council, big, uh, big deep dive into data, a study that shows that we can get to low cost renewable hydrogen and decarbonized hydrogen by 2030. Uh, this follows some other reports over the last year that that have said similar things. But also on the website, like you said, we now have a new news page where we are um, placing key articles. Um, it's a great way to keep up to date. But we also have another, um, uh, I think, interesting um, resource for people. We have what we call our resources database, which is a database of key documents related to hydrogen and fuel cell technology. So if you're trying to track down and uh, key documents, it's a good way to find them. In fact, a lot of times we use that database ourselves. And so we put things on there that we would want to use. So if you're a little wonkish, this is a, a good way to stay up to date. No, really, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I know here in the state of Hawaii, our legislature uh, isn't forthcoming with a whole lot of funding to do studies and figure things out. And uh, we look to California and your resources to get into how to standardize stations, J2601, uh, NFPA2, you know, all of the regulations and the models that, that, you know, why recreate the wheel when California has already done it and done a good job at it. So we appreciate um, being able to use those resources. It, and I will tell you on behalf of our members, both public and private, um, we are very happy to talk to other states and share with them information about what we've learned, um, at least on the passenger vehicle market. This just launched in 2014, really more like 2015. We've learned a lot of lessons. And I think some states are waiting for us to really kind of learn all of the lessons and then they're gonna jump into the game. Um, but uh, when it comes to passenger cars, when it comes to buses and now to trucks, 
Uh, they're really ramping that up. Uh, if you look at buses, for example, California early last year mandated that all transit buses will go zero emission by 2040. So that's the first vehicle category that we know of around the globe that has been mandated to go zero emission. Great. Um, they are now looking at it with trucks. And um, uh, so we should know more about that. They've got, it's called the, I believe it's the uh, Advanced Clean Truck Regulation. And uh, right now it's being look, uh, reviewed by the California Air Resources Board. And they will likely have a decision by the end of this year. Right. Well, we're going to have to take a quick break here, Keith, and we'll be back in 60 seconds okay. and talk a little bit more about what's going on in California. Aloha. I'm Keisha King, host of At the Crossroads, where we have conversations that are real and relevant. We have spoken with community leaders from right here locally in Hawaii and all around the world. Won't you join us on thinktechhawaii.com or on YouTube on the Think Tech Hawaii channel. Our conversations are real, relevant, and lots of fun. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. I have a TV show based on my book, which is also called Beyond the Lines. And it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and building winning teams. We are having a fun drive for Think Tech Hawaii. And please, 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 please help us keep these shows going. Please go on our website, thinktechhawaii.com, to donate. Thank you. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man. Hey, I don't have to do this on my lunch hour now that I'm retired. That's pretty cool. I like this. I can actually have a leisurely lunch for once in a while. Anyway, we're talking to Keith Malone from the California Fuel Cell Partnerships, and we just started talking a little bit about the resources that they have available online to help any of the cities, municipalities, states, uh, or private sector folks that want to start doing things in hydrogen and don't know where to look. Um, California is a great uh, font of uh, knowledge and experience in getting these uh, stations online, um, helping to standardize equipment, um, fire protection codes, and things like that. So um, great. I would check out the California Fuel Cell Partnerships website and and milk it for all it's worth because it's got some great information there. One of the articles that Keith put in his newsletter, um, I think last year, probably middle of the year, was uh, a story about some of the big um, gas companies putting liquid hydrogen plants in the U.S. And the reason it caught my attention was not much uh, earlier than that, probably early last year or last summer, I was at a conference and, I, and there was a liquid hydrogen specialist in the room, so I asked him how much production, liquid hydrogen production there was across the entire U.S. and Canada. And he said, really not that much. And the average, uh, the average plant was maybe 20 tons a day, and most of it went to NASA. But just in the last uh, 14 months or so, um, there have been four liquid hydrogen plants being announced or being built in the continental U.S. California, Nevada, and Texas, I believe, are three of them. I think two of them in California. A lot of them are designated just for transportation. So do you have any any other news besides that on these uh, liquid hydrogen plants? Because that's a real key indicator of scale. You know, we talk about scaling hydrogen up. I, I think it's an indication that um, uh, that kind of the demonstration phase is definitely over that we are well into the early commercial um, commercial market. There is recognition by leading international companies that it's time to scale up. Uh, we know that the number of fuel cell cars in California are going to continue increasing. We've already heard from Hyundai and Toyota that in a couple of years, they're going to be significantly increasing the output of fuel cell vehicles. And so you have companies like Air Liquide and Air Products that are, are getting ready to build uh, uh, plants that help meet those needs. And I think it's an indication there, are, there is recognition even beyond uh, kind of the industrial gas uh, community that 
more hydrogen is needed and especially renewable and decarbonized hydrogen. And I expect this year, it wouldn't surprise me if we begin to hear that folks in the wind and solar industry are getting into hydrogen. I think there is a recognition, for example, that um, batteries provide certainly a benefit for energy storage, but that when you want to get to a scale of gigawatts and in some cases, terawatts of power, hydrogen starts to become one of those tools available to them. And what I've seen over the last year, the interest has, has definitely increased. Um, just the fact that it's not just the Hydrogen Council, but now you're seeing um, many of the consultancies like McKinsey and Company, Deloitte, uh, and a few others are now beginning to do deep dives into this subject. Uh, even, even institutes like within the utility industry, like EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute. Uh, so, so lots of indicators that we've moved beyond the earliest stages of the commercial launch. You know, you mentioned, um, you mentioned in there, you were talking about clean or green hydrogen or clean hydrogen um, in, when you talked about uh, liquid hydrogen. I don't think some of the viewers understand that um, quite a bit of the hydrogen that's produced, um, especially in the continental U.S., is uh, steam reform from methane. And that's still a carbon-based process and starts off with carbon that has to be sequestered or have to, have to do something with it to keep it from, you know, being released into the atmosphere. And so what's the difference between that majority and this green uh, liquid hydrogen you're talking about? Well, one of the things uh, that's certainly a criticism that some use against fuel cell electric vehicles, um, this sort of... I won't call it a myth, but I call it a distortion of what is going on. Um, the one thing I, I make clear to people is that hydrogen is on a renewable pathway, especially here in California and around the globe. Here in California for hydrogen fuel, right now we've mandated that at least 33% of that hydrogen has to come from renewable sources. With that new low carbon fuel standard credit, um, also comes the requirement that the renewable content goes up to 40%. And you're going to see stakeholders this year likely introduce legislation that will put us on a pathway to 100% renewable and decarbonized hydrogen. Which is basically hydrogen out of an electrolyzer, correct? Well, it could be hydrogen from an electrolyzer using renewable power, solar, wind, geothermal, um, but also it could be hydrogen from biomass, like sewage or agricultural waste, that you either use the same hot steam method, that steam reforma reformation method, or using tri-generation fuel cells. And there are other ways to make it renewably as well, but I, I really don't have the time to talk about all of them. But um, I do want to emphasize the fact that just like electricity is on a renewable pathway, so is hydrogen. Right, right. That's but important. There are... Here in Hawaii, you know, we think of electrolyzers as being the primary clean source of hydrogen because we don't have any, well, we have very little natural gas. We have some from wastewater systems mm -hmm. and we have some from landfills but we don't have a plethora of natural gas. We even import that to supply 80% of our customers here. So for us, clean hydrogen primarily comes from solar and wind curtailed power and electrolysis. But the bottom line is like you say, that if you have an electric vehicle here in Hawaii and you plug into Hawaiian Electric, it ain't clean electricity. It's, it's a fuel oil based, you know, fossil fuel electricity for the most part being generated. So unless you have your own solar on your roof, and you're, you're fueling your car up, your battery, charging your batteries from your own solar. You're not even clean and green when you're driving an electric car necessarily. But your, your point of there's a pathway for electric and for hydrogen. And we're both on the same trajectory. And, and if you look at every kind of every state or actually really every region, they have different means of producing hydrogen renewably or in, in a decarbonized form using carbon capture. And everyone's gonna do it differently. Like up in the state of Washington in the Pacific Northwest, they're gonna use a lot of hydropower. California, it's gonna be wind and solar. In Texas, definitely wind power. They've got um, salt caverns there where they can store that hydrogen 
in vast amounts. Like I said earlier, gigawatts and terawatts of power. Um, so everyone's going to do it differently. We're all going to get to that new renewable future um, in a different pathway. And and so for Hawaii, it's going to be through electrolyzers. Yeah. You know, and it makes the most yeah. sense. I mean, if you look at like I said, if you look at what we've seen just over the last year, the, some major reports have come out. Bloomberg, NEF, our Bloomberg New Energy Fund, just did a study that echoed what the Hydrogen Council just issued, which is we're going to get to lower cost, renewable, and decarbonized hydrogen by 2030. Lots of good indicators. Yeah, yeah in fact, um, you know, I was in Texas a while ago, and and some of the wind producers, and I was actually talking to some of the folks that sell as power power providers to the utility. He said that sometimes they're they're selling the power for as little as two cents a kilowatt hour, and they're still able to make a turn a profit at that. And they average around four cents a kilowatt hour. And what we use locally in our calculations, if we can get our hydrogen produced with electricity down at around seven cents a kilowatt hour, we're actually competing with diesel fuel and gas on a on a price price wise. And uh, so we like that, and and quite frankly, we're finding some of the curtailed power here in Hawaii now that you don't have net metering. Um, we're, we're actually talking to people who have larger um, power production facilities and they're talking seven to 10 cents a kilowatt hour. And that's getting us right in the ballpark of competing with gas today, not 30 years from now. So we're really excited about that kind of stuff. Absolutely. California about two, two almost three years ago, we had a unique situation where we actually paid Arizona to take our excess renewables and Arizona shut down its renewables to accept them. And so obviously batteries, hydrogen and other forms of energy storage, as we increase them, we'll begin to avoid those kinds of situations. Right. Uh, but it also points to the fact that hydrogen starts to become this really interesting business opportunity and opportunity for grid balancing that um, we haven't thought of before for a long time, up until just a couple of years ago at the partnership we were, you know, our members really were thinking of hydrogen as a fuel and with kind of the rapid expansion of the renewables market, we now look at hydrogen as uh, an uh, grid balancer, as a sector coupler, um, really this sort of interesting opportunity that we really need to explore because it's all related. This yep. hydrogen kind of ecosystem, this hydrogen society, as the Japanese and the South Koreans are increasingly referring to it, um, you know, it gives us, um, it, it allows us to kind of think more broadly and look for opportunities, just as the battery electrics are looking at the grid and kind of how battery electric cars might interact with the grid in a way just beyond, you know, fueling those vehicles or charging them. All right. Believe it or not, Keith, we blasted through 30 minutes and uh, we got to wrap it up here. But uh, hey, do me a favor and check in with Joe Pratt up there in San Francisco on that ferry and see how it's doing. And we'll have you back in another couple of weeks and we'll, uh, we'll get caught up on the maritime side as well. All right. Great. Okay, Keith, thanks for uh, being on the show with us today. And until next week. Stan Osterman signing off. Aloha.